Thank you, choir, very nice. Thank you for that uh, ministry and for reminding us of one of uh, our great God and Savior's blessed titles, the Lord of all. Uh, we are so glad that you are here. Once again, our uh, house, God's house, is filled with uh, not only our precious uh, people, but many special guests and visitors. Again, we appreciate you being with us. We're certainly looking forward to what God has in store for us this morning. Good to see Josh Winters and his lovely bride as well. Got a great deal for you. Gets no better than this. You come back tonight. Communion and the Super Bowl. It gets no better than that. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. As you find that, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Thank you. you may be seated for our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so pleased and privileged to be in your house again today. We've come to worship you. It certainly is part of our heart cry even now that you would help us in that all-important endeavor. Our choir has beautifully sung of you, Lord. You are indeed the Lord of all, and I pray that you would help us to allow that blessed title with all of its ramifications of truth to funnel down to us in a most practical way. Because if you really are Lord of all, then that means you're Lord of my heart. And that means that such heart is cultivated and ready to receive your truth because your words come to us and uh, we are your glad servants and you are our master and our Lord, yea, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So it really does help us even in our study and we're glad for that. Thank you for each one who is here today. Thank you for the various ways in which we get to worship our great God and Savior, including our giving. May you be pleased as we give today. Lord, we desire that every aspect of our service would bring honor and glory to you and exalt you and your precious Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, oh God, how we love and are embracing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And, oh God, how we desire to share such good news with those who have not yet trusted Christ. Do that great work today as well, we plead. Thank you for meeting here with us. Thank you for the opportunities that lie before us. May we be faithful at every turn, and may you be pleased as we proceed. We pray this for Jesus' sake and in his matchless name, amen.
Amen. Thank you, ladies. We so, so appreciate our musicians. Our ladies did a, a beautiful job, and it's, and it's a blessing. This is the hymn that I hope you know. Now, it's a short one, and um, I believe the tune will be familiar to you. By the way, if you have trouble sleeping, this is a nice song concerning that too. Let's stand and turn to number four, God who made the earth and heaven. Now there are two verses. The children are dismissed on that second verse. Number four in the hymnals, both verses. God who made the earth and heaven, darkness and light, who the day for toil has given for rest the night, may your angels guard defend us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have aided by the Spirit of God to be good students of the Word of God. We recognize again that we're standing on holy and hallowed ground when we open up the pages of your book. We realize that our hearts uh, must be marked by humility and certainly a sense of submission to your awesome truth. And we've prayed a prayer already that certainly lends itself to the proper reception of the word of God in our hearts. And because of that, our heart cry at this juncture is that we would leave here a changed people. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit of God, who actually has tabernacled in the hearts of the saints, to turn the light on for us. And then as we see your truth aids us in practically applying it to our lives. Thus, a changed people. It's a great prospect. We know that it's pleasing to you. May it be the case this morning we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We come this morning to verses 6 through 8 of chapter 1 and day 2 of the six-day creation week. Very exciting. I know that we read these verses for our scripture reading this morning, but I'd like to read them again. So here we go, Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament 
from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. You, you know, you, you, you saw and heard the word firmament uh, a, a number of times. I remind you that that word is dropping actually from the anthropomorphic lips of the great creator God. And so it's a very significant word, as you would anticipate. Before we look a little closer at that, I wanted to note something with you in regard to day two, and it's a valuable notation. God takes great pain in communicating to us that he desires for us to see day two's activity which comes from his anthropomorphic hands. Actually, it is, as you know, according to Colossians 1.16, the second personage of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is creating. God takes great pains in communicating to us that he desires for us to see day, two, day two's activities in relationship to day one, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, we know that for at least two reasons, from two st standpoints, if you will, God emphasizes that. One, and forgive me for the simplistic observation, but that's usually what you get from Pastor Tom, God is actually counting for us here. And although that may not mean too much to you, I actually like that. This is the great creator God, and he's saying one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Every word, absolutely vital truth. And here God is counting. So it isn't just two, it's boy, remember one, and anticipate three, four, five, six, and seven. But we know that God desires for us to see day two's activity in relationship to the other days of creation because of the very first word that we have in verse 6. You see it there, and who would have ever dreamed that one of the more significant terms and words in our text this morning would be the very first three-letter word, a conjunction, and, A, and, a N D. Sorry, my Michigan accent was creeping up on me there. It's awful nice that you can blame on anything on a Michigan accent. We find this conjunction and A N D. We find it not only at the beginning of six, but we verse six, but we saw it at the beginning of verse 2, we saw it at the beginning of verse 3, we saw it at the beginning of verse 4, we saw it at the beginning of verse 5, and not that alone, we will see it at the beginning of verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 28, 29, 30, and 31. Here's the thing. Each time God breathed. We're accustomed to something, and you guys, you have a good uh, hermeneutic, the science of interpretation, and we've learned a lot even together, and we're thankful for that. And the fact of the matter is we recognize that oftentimes in our translation of the original manuscripts, our translation, this English translation of what we would refer to broadly as the word of God, that the translators um, often, but with warrant, supply a word in order to make sense of the reading of the text. And so there are times when you can turn in the Word of God, our B-I-B-L-E, and you'll recognize that there may be a conjunction that is italicized, and the reason why it is is because it's not actually there in the original language. It's been supplied by the translators. 
And again, as you read it, you recognize that there's warrant for that. This conjunction and repeated time and time and time and time again is not supplied by the translators, but rather God-breathed. It's a big deal. What are we to make of this divine, repetitive use of this tiny three-letter three letter we would view as an insignificant word? What are we to make of the divine, repetitive use of this term, this conjunction? Well, we need not speculate. It is so clearly an emphasis on the sequence of events, on the sequence of events. The term, this repetitive use on the part, not of the translators of Scripture, but the one who breathed the Scriptures out, is an emphasis on the uninterrupted sequential nature of the creation week account. It's almost, and this is Tommy Till language, but once you start reading, like with Genesis 1-1, there is no stopping. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's and, 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 and. Say, Pastor Tom, I, well, I guess maybe you have seen me excited about three letter words. Big deal. So very significant. I'm stressing that with you because, and we've seen an awful lot, and God has, through the word of God and the spirit of God, has already established a lot in regard to us and even our apologetic concerning these things. But I stress that with you so that you would see, even from a technical, and the better word is grammatical, even from a grammatical standpoint, there is no room for gaps here. No room for long ages. And this is especially true and dramatically true when you go back, and I'd like to take you there, we have the time to do that, when you go back and you look at the very first use of this conjunction, again, God-breathed, not supplied by the translator, but supplied by God. It's especially dramatically true when you go back to the very first use, and that's at the beginning of verse 2. And, 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 by the way, I... I, maybe I'll do this. I didn't know if I should or not, and I kind of left it with the Spirit of God, and so i speaking a little bit more off the top of my heart. But, you know, you read through the Genesis account, uh, uh, God's account of creation, and all of these and, 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 and I tried to think of, you know, a, 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 something that would be equivalent very practically in our lives, and I couldn't help but think of our Young people, for instance, and maybe they come home a little bit later than they should have on any given evening. Not that you would have a curfew or anything like that. Because, I mean, y'all are just totally trustworthy. You come home a little bit later than you're supposed to, and uh, I don't know, who who do you fear a little bit more, mom or dad? Boy, it, it was close with me, I'll tell you that. Uh, d- Dad sits down and says, uh, hey, you're supposed to be home an hour ago. And then he says, I- I'd like you to recount your evening for me. And so you start, and you say, well, we went to Applebee's, and we got the half-off appetizers, and then we blah, blah, yakety schmackety, and then we bob, blah, blah, yakety schmackety, and then we, and then we, and then we, and finally I came home. Only sadly an hour later than I was supposed to. No long ages in the account. No significant gaps. In fact, if you leave a significant gap for dad, you are in a peck of trouble. Here's God. You would think he's a stutterer. 
but he's absolutely communicating to us, even grammatically, that there's no room for long ages in the creation account. And so we have verse 1, you're familiar with it now, and we've studied our way through it. We'll certainly continue to come back to it because it holds sway and weight for us right on through the whole course of our study. In verse 1, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the very first word of verse 2 is what, class? And, guess what? The conjunction that is actually there in the original language, which means that it's not supplied by the translators, but rather it is supplied by God. God, even grammatically, again, takes great pains to communicate to us that you can't place a long age, a large or long gap between verses 1 and 2, nor between verses 2 and the rest of the creation account as God counts for us, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this conjunction and governs, governs the entire account. By the way, if you've been with us, you know that we had an entire session that really dealt with the space between verses 1 and 2. And we're careful to note that the reason why there's a space between verses 1 and 2 is because God has not spoken between verses 1 and 2. But man has. But even a cursory reading of the text, when you see that first word at the beginning of verse 2, it is communicated to us ultimately by God that there is a sequence that is unfolding. By the way, and I'll insert this very quickly, I want to go one step further with you. In, in other words, if, and this is a Tommy Till comment, so you take it for what it's worth. If God wanted to communicate to us that there was a significant gap, a long age between verses 1 and 2, he uses the wrong conjunction at the beginning of verse 2. And don't you hate that when God makes a mistake. And I'm serious. Since I have you thinking about grammar, let me uh, go one step further further with you. And, and this is a bit technical even for me, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read something to you and, and then you'll see how we can really understand what I just read, even though initially we think we don't understand it. <laughs> the Hebrew word here behind the English word and is, is the Hebrew word wa. Here's what we know from a grammatical standpoint. When the Hebrew conjunction wa is followed by a noun, I'm, I'm referring now again to verse 2, the very big beginning of verse 2. We have, the, we, we have the Hebrew conjunction wa here translated by our English word and. When wa is followed by a noun, and that is clearly the case in verse 2, the noun being what class? Earth and the earth is how verse 2 reads. When you have the Hebrew conjunction wa followed by a noun, it is called, again from a Hebrew grammatical standpoint, it is called a wa copulative. Here's what a wa copulative communicates to us in regard to verses 1 and 2. A wa copulative communicates to us that verse 1 and this is just a little technical, but it's okay. Actually, this first part is not very technical. It took me a while, but it won't take you any time at all. It communicates to us that verse 1 is the subject verb clause. And by the way, we actually do understand that. The subject, God. The verb, what is God doing? What's the activity? Creating, and of course the objects of his creation are the heavens and the earth which, by the way, captures all of God's creation, especially the emphasis. You, I could understand if people read verse 1 and all we had there was earth by way of focus, and I could understand why some people would say, well, maybe we have God creating earth here, but maybe there's a lot of other creations that God has or is or will do. I shared with you in regard to verse 1, I can't believe, and I'm on a roll which may not be very good. I'm sure not bragging about that. 
I communicated to you that we have in verse 1 what is called a Hebrew mirism. It's where God takes the two extremes of something. This is true in regard to the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Where God takes two extremes, and obviously as he mentions those two extremes, he's communicating to us that what we ought to have in mind is the whole thing. It's interesting that the Hebrew language does not have a word for universe. And that's part of the reason why God often speaks about the heavens. Not one, not two, but three. So that when we see that in Scripture, we know that God's talking about the, the as they used to say, the whole kit and caboodle. All of creation, the universe. Three heavens, as you know, delineated and described in Scripture. Our atmospheric he- heaven, the air we breathe, the uh, where, where the birds fly. Oh, I love birds. I saw a mature bald eagle flying right over 55 this past Friday. And, and it was kind of neat because you could tell that he was coming down. And I missed it then. I, I was wondering if he was going to attack me. And I, rem- I, and I said to Ann after that, you'd given it a call, because again, it doesn't take too much to thrill me, is, man, I, I never saw bald eagles growing up. And I've always been interested in God's creation, always been interested in animals, always been interested in about birds. And I, I used to think that, man, you're going to go, you're gonna have to go to Alaska to see a bald eagle. And now we see them just about every time we're out. It's absolutely amazing. There's a lot of bald eagles around here. Awesome bird. And I've got to stop talking to you about birds. I have no idea what I was heading <laughs> heading to either. Oh, the atmosphere. The <laughs> Thank you. It wasn't you. It was the Holy Spirit, but wow. But your laughing helped. The atmosphere that we breathe, heaven number one, the stellar heavens, heaven number two, where we find the stars and um, sun, moon, sun, moon, and stars, heaven two, and And then heaven three, the abode of God. Actually referred to by the word paradise, which God's people can understand. Not one heaven, three heavens. And God uses the plural term for heaven in verse 1 so that we'd be recognizing that this isn't some isolated time of creation on the part of the creator, but rather this is when the universe was created by the one and only creator. Everything that ever was created was created right here in this six-day creation week. So what the Wa copulative does is it makes verse 1, where God created the heavens and earth, it makes that the, um, the, the subject-verb clause. And in turn, and again an inseparable link between verses 1 and 2, God, again, shouldn't have used a conjunction if he wanted to communicate anything else to it. It makes verse 1 the subject-verb clause, and it makes verse 2 the circumstantial clause. Not that we have another circumstance, but rather a circumstance that is in direct description of verse 1, the subject-verb clause. I forgot to breathe, I forgot to swallow, and everything else on that. You say, well, Pastor Tom, now tell us in Tommy Teal language what that means. And again, you check this out for your own. I I, I don't want you to take my word for it. Verse 2, from a grammatical standpoint, absolutely describes the state of the original creation. Verse 2 absolutely describes the state of the original created earth. It's a further description of what God began to do on verse on, on day one. An awesome, awesome thing. Say all that say to you again, and you say, Pastor Tom, you are absolutely belaboring the point. Yes. 
no gap. No long ages. Listen, you don't have to continue to be frustrated by taking the supposed necessary millions and billions of years of the evolutionists and trying to find some place to jam that in. The word of God broadly in God's creation account that we have here in Genesis 1. By the way, we talked about angels last week. How, how many were here last week? I'm not sure why I did that. It's like, you know, I'm, oh, I counted and saw and everything else. We, we talked about angels, and as I thought about what uh, God did with us in regard to that particular topic, I realized that actually we arrived at a syllogism. Now, syllogism is a form of deductive reasoning that consists of a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And again, not as complicated as what it sounds. And here's the syllogism that we arrived at in regard to angels, which is a very interesting topic. Here's how it goes. If angels are created beings, I'm, I'm going to say more, but let me give you this syllogism in its simplicity first so that you see it and hear it and know it and I don't lose you. If angels are created beings and if all things were created by God during the six-day creation week, then angels were created during the six-day creation week. Let me insert some biblical text for those of you that are taking notes. If angels are created beings, and we absolutely know that they are, Colossians 1.16. And if all things were created by God during the six-day creation week, we know that from Genesis 1. We know that from Exodus 20 and verse 11. We know that from Exodus 31 and verse 17. We know that from, uh, from John chapter 1 and verse 3. And we know that from Colossians 1 and verse 16. If all things were created by God during the six-day creation week, then of necessity angels were created during the six-day creation week. So last week we ended up at really what is a valuable apologetic. Here's the thing. Some people put Satan, who is an angel, Some people put Satan, who, who is an angel, some people put Satan's fall between verses 1 and 2. And, and I want to tell you why that cannot be. Again, if God created everything that's created, including angels, if everything that's created was created by God during the creation week, including angels and subsequently men... then we can't have Satan's fall between verses 1 and 2. When God gets done, I alluded to this last week, so it's not really new, but I'm saying it by way of point of emphasis this morning. When God gets done with his creation work at the end of the sixth day, he looks at everything that he created and dubs it very good. It's Genesis 1.31, we'll eventually get to it. When God gets done with his creative work, such creative work encompassing everything in the universe, including angels and men, when God gets done with his creative work at the end of the creation week, he dubs everything very good, which means that Satan, his fall, and obviously man and his fall, had to take place after the creation week. I trust that I don't have to say any more about that. God looks at everything that he had created and says, very good. You can be assured of this, any fall, on the part of any of God's creation, including angels and men, took place after the creation week. 
Now let me do one other thing with you, and then I've got to get back, obviously, and engage our text. But you, you could tell even from reading that we have one pointed thing here, and it's going to be a joy to look at that. But l- let, me, uh, let me do one other thing with you here, since I have you where I have you. Uh, sort of a postscript to what we've just said. And a reminder, again, speaking of Satan's fall. By the way, when you speak of Satan's fall, um, the implication is that's when Satan fell between, uh, for those who propose this, that Satan fell between verses 1 and 2. When you believe that Satan, what I want you to see is what a slippery slope you get on if you insert Satan's fall between verses 1 and 2. If you believe it, that Satan fell between verses 1 and 2, then of necessity you are practically embracing what is called the ruin restoration theory. We've talked about that before, so I need not belabor that. But I, I, I remind you that the, that the person who embraces the ruin rest, uh, rest, uh, the, the ruin reconstruction theory it is what we would refer to as a gapist. The gap theory, the two are inseparably linked. And you recall that for the gapist, when you get to verse 2, which says, and the earth was without form and void, that the gapist, the ruined reconstructionist, he interprets these words as ruined and desolate. And the reason why he does is because you not only have Satan's fall between verses 1 and 2, but you also have Satan's judgment. Uh, and, and that is divine judgment, obviously from God, on Satan that very much influences and impacts the earth that God had created. So between verses 1 and 2, you not only have Satan's fall, but you also have divine judgment that is evident, listen, in the geologic column of this present earth. If you talk to a gapist, if you talked to a ruin reconstructionist and he was consistent with his theory, he would testify to you that the fossil record that we now are uncovering is really a testament of the judgment that took place between verses 1 and 2 in regard to Satan and his fall. And the reason why he proposes that is you can hear in that, again, an accommodation of the millions and billions of years. You can tell an amazingly fanciful story between verses 1 and 2. And as we noted before, you can insert in how many years you need, you can insert it there in the space between verses 1 and 2. Here's the thing, and this is part of the reason why I say, man, when you... When you try to insert Satan's fall in between verses 1 and 2, you instantaneously are standing on a slippery slope because the ruin reconstructionist rejects Genesis chapter 6 through 9 and the worldwide Noahic flood. And he says our geologic record and column, our fossil record, if you will, is a testament not of the Noahic worldwide flood, but rather the flood that took place by way of divine judgment in regard to Satan and his fall, which they proposed took place between verses 1 and 2. Here's the problem with that, if you followed all of that. It's for the Gappas, the ruined reconstructionist. He has, he, listen very carefully, he has sickness, disease, and death unfolding on this earth in regard to Satan's fall between verses 1 and 2. And if I asked you, and I'm, I, for the sake of time I'm not, but if I asked you, do you see a biblical problem with that, one of the first things that would come to your mind is Romans 5.12 that says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered this world and death by sin. There is no death, no sickness, no disease before the fall of man. 
biblical problem. Now, whew, let me re-engage our text. Verse 6. Th- this is so exciting. And God said, and God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Again, it's day two of the creation week. And as I read it and as I had the privilege of running ahead of you and studying just a little bit, I just was constantly in my mind and sometimes even with my hands doing this. How exciting. I was going to make you do that, but I want to keep my job. How exciting. God's people would be excited even about things like firmaments. But oh, the awesome work of God. God on day two creates a firmament. And according to verse 8, he refers to it as heaven. And, And then this firmament, according to the two preceding verses, divides the waters from the waters. Again, curious language, and I trust you don't complicate it because, again, good news, there's really nothing too complicated here, but let me take you back to something that we've already seen. By the way, let me make that clear then. God divides the firmament. He puts some water in some form above the firmament, and then he keeps some water in some form so, some form below the firmament. So you see the division, the firmament here, water in some form up here, and water in some form down here. If I can take you back to our, um, to our observations in regard to day one, one of the activities that we watched in wonder concerning in regard to day one is when God, actually the Holy Spirit of God, crafted this earth, in the form of a sphere, a ball. It's interesting that we don't have dry land evident until day three, which means that in regard to day one, when we watch the Holy Spirit form this earth into a sphere, that to us, it would look like one big watery ball. Again, no dry land until day three. It's coming, by the way. It's the next day. Pretty exciting. So if you would picture with me this big watery ball. By the way, you won't get this terminology in any science textbook. <laughs> Both good or bad science textbooks. because you know, you know, it's, it's, it's Tommy Teal stuff. What God does on day two, forgive me for the simplicity, is he takes some of the water from the surface of this watery ball. By the way, everything that God needed was already there. That's why when we get to day three next time, we're going to watch the land actually appear. God doesn't have to create that. It's already created. He's just going to do the potter thing. Awesome. On day two, we watch as God takes what appears to us to be a watery ball, and he takes some of the water off from the surface of that that sphere, and he places it above the firmament. He does that in the form of a water vapor canopy. We'll talk a lot more about that when we get to Noah's flood. By the way, if you have a water vapor canopy and it's high, we're talking like ionosphere stuff. If you have a water vapor high, what that does is it creates absolutely a greenhouse effect. And all of a sudden, you're talking about an earth that has been absolutely and awesomely prepared for somebody to really, really enjoy. God takes some of the water off from the surface of this watery ball, and he places it above the firmament in the form of a water vapor canopy. And the rest of the water he leaves on the surface. And guess what? With day three, he's going to do the potter thing in regard to the water that is left on the surface of the earth. 
And so we'll watch with joy next week, the Lord willing, as God makes the seas an ocean. And tells, like our little kids have learned, our twos and threes, oh, they ought to teach us. God's going to tell the water, you go just so far. That's what God says, you go just so far. And guess what? The water obeys. That's day two. <laughs> it's awesome. He creates this water vapor canopy that's going to come into play in a most significant way as our study in Genesis comes into, uh, y- you know, uh, unfolds. And, and then we watch as he prepares things for his day three activities where, where now we're going to have the, the seas and the ocean. Here's the thing. I think we see it from day one, but with day two, I am especially beginning to see God's special work in regard to this earth. I'm referring like to the greenhouse effect. Boy, he must really love somebody if he prepares a place like that and puts them on that. We're starting to see with day two, and it will snowball in a wonderful and blessed way, how special this earth is. By the way, and I'll give you a biblical warrant for this, but just to, um, I can't think of the word, to tease you a little bit. You don't have to be looking for life elsewhere. God champions the earth because he champions living organisms and especially he champions his crown creation and guess who that is? You. Something else I'm absolutely amazed at is we're studying in Genesis you think boy it has nothing to do with Christ and we know that it has everything to do with Christ. You say boy we're studying creation it probably has nothing to do with salvation and we're discovering it has everything to do with salvation. And here it is again. God created this earth in a most wonderful way. This earth is absolutely unique from everything else that God created, including all the stars and all of the planets. And he created this earth in a very special way for a very special people, man. And the reason why he put man on this earth is so that he, God, could actually fellowship and commune with us. Can you believe that? And what did we do? We absolutely rebelled against God. And what did God do? Listen. He sent his son. He should have given us the cosmic boot. It should have been hellfire. But he loved us so much that he sent his son. Why did Christ come? Well, to care for the matter of of our sin. Why is that so significant? Because it's our sin that keeps us from communing and fellowshipping with God. You see it? You wonder why we're just, every time we're together, we're, we're, um, we're preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, the good news, the gospel. And, it, and, and you see it at every turn in the word of God, including the creation account. God put you on this earth, and he did so so that he could commune and fellowship with you. But our sin absolutely separates us from God. But that God loved us so much that he sent his son, and Christ loved us so much that he came and did what he needed to do on Calvary's cross so that you and I could be forgiven and so that your and my broken relationship with the holy God could be restored That's exactly what he does when we put our faith and trust him. No wonder Pastor Tom would plead again this morning, trust Christ. We're sinners. We're in need of the one and only Savior because of our sin. Trust Christ. Be saved today and then join us as we continue to walk through this awesome, awesome creation count. I got to let you go. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much. It's, well, you're our wonderful Lord and The B-I-B-L-E is the wonderful word of God, wonderful words of life indeed. 
And uh, I, I shared this with your precious people in this place, but I reiterated even in this prayer, here we are studying creation. And yet it all just constantly takes us back to Christ, not only as the creator, but also as the one and only Savior. So I pray that each one who is here today, that there's been a point in time in their life when they saw their need of Christ because of their sin and they prayed to receive Christ as their own personal Savior. And if they haven't done that, that they would do so even now in the quietness of this moment. And then what? You save us. You honor your word, your, your, your pledge, your promise to us. We put our faith and trust in the one and only Savior, and you absolutely save us, absolutely rescue us, absolutely redeem us, absolutely save. God, what then? Well, now we're back to our choir song, Lord of all. So may we leave here this morning with two things true. You're our Savior, and you are our Lord. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with the first verse of our hymn that praises God for his creative powers. And as we have been once again reminded, God created earth for us. He created us for himself. Let's stand and sing first verse of number one, For the Beauty of the Earth. Number one, verse one. For the beauty of the earth. Ask Brother Bill Rogo to please close us in a word of prayer. Brother Bill. Heavenly Father, we bring you our praise. Not only because you've given us your word, you've helped us to understand the creation of this world, but you've helped us to understand that you love each one of us. We've gone astray. You've sent your Son who loved us and gave himself for us. May we return that love to you by living for you, by telling others about you. And we'll praise you throughout all the days of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>